This is the second collab film, which is very much about asking five leaders what makes for successful collaboration and what are the demons inside themselves, what are the things that they have a habit of doing that they know as the leader of collaboration usually messes things up, what are the instincts they need to sort of knock out of their heads. I think we all, we all live in partnership meetings and you know I think people like me spend huge amounts of time in partnership meetings uh, but often you're trying to do this very much on a part-time basis you've got some people who meet now and again you'll have another meeting in six weeks time you'll hope that something might happen the reality often is that you get out in the minutes a week before the next meeting and rush around trying to do something and I think that is massively frustrating uh, I think in, in most of the situations you've got to establish a full-time team that are going to make this happen you've got to invest in it uh, but trying to do it fitting around every, everybody else's day job, all you're doing is putting more pressure on your own staff, and the thing just elongates so far that people just lose energy and interest. How you see yourself is entirely different to how other people see you and your role in it, and how they react to what you say will often be governed by how they see you in the in the hierarchy, if I can put it that way, the informal hierarchy of any meeting or any of the process um, and you have to find some way of getting to a point where this genuinely feels like there's a, a level of uh, equal, no, not everybody's equal, but a level of equal kind of contribution and equal uh, status in the collaborative process and not being aware of that can actually lead you to think you've got everybody on side and in truth you haven't because they've not really come clean with you about where they where they stand and so the thing unravels over time. Um, you sit off to make a film and you know exactly what direction you should be going in. The problem is you've got a lot of people begin to chip in and their, their sense of direction is 1%, 2% off from yours and then another person's 2% off, another person 2% off and all of a sudden by being a nice guy you suddenly discover you're actually not making that film, you're making that film and one day you step back and say that's not the film I wanted to make. And it isn't the film you want to make. The problem is, it is the direct result of a whole series of small, human, completely decent compromises which have actually destroyed your objective. You do have to listen. I agree you have to listen. But you're there to listen. You know you have to listen. What you have to remember to do is to watch. Because if you don't watch, then, frankly, you have to watch out. And um, it reminds me, I'm just remembering as, as talking about this, um, I once broke down a long time ago now on the hard shoulder and a lorry driver came along and he picked me up and he gave me his pearls of wisdom. And his pearl of wisdom was, don't just look at the indicators, watch the wheels. And I do try to remember that when I'm driving, but I particularly try to remember it when I'm in meetings. Because in meetings, of course you listen to what people say, but watch what they're feeling. Because what they're feeling is going to govern the outcome. The ones that get my goat tend to be the silent partners. I don't mind generally people who are challenging or even arsy in debate because you can thresh things out in debate. What I have a difficulty with is people who are constantly reserving their position. And um, first of all, I think it's important to understand where those individuals are coming from, whether it's a different organisation or whether it's about them or whether it's about a set of objectives that actually are coming from a completely different place from what you understood to be the purpose of the uh, collaboration. So you have to spend time with them and you have to work out the best way of flushing out what the real issues are and they tend to be people who simply don't operate confidently or comfortably in a collective uh, environment. Um, but some of those people can nonetheless have real power and leverage and influence uh, and uh, even though it's a bit irritating you need to spend disproportionate time usually with the people who are less energizing and less collaborative precisely because the other ones you've got a clear and relatively straightforward sense of common purpose already. When I've been trying to structure meetings I often make a point of sitting myself in a relaxed fashion which would enable me to become alert to when I can feel those neck muscles tensing and when I can feel my hands grasping the handles of the seat you know, too strongly 
because then I know that my feelings are actually talking to me and presumably everybody else. And I need to be watching out for that because the danger is that I too will be thinking subliminally, well, what does this mean for me? What about me in all this? Um, and I can therefore be obstructing the meeting just as much as anybody else. Yeah, I think the greatest one for any police officer certainly is impatience. We tend to be very can-do and action oriented. Sometimes in a partnership that's good to move things on. Sometimes I think uh, it can be a bad thing because um, you know, we, we, we're too willing to get on with things and don't take the time to create the relationships and establish common values. So I think that's the side of me. It's really impatience that uh, you know, you're, you're having to try and deal with. Uh, sometimes your own wish to, to lead things uh, and take control, but often you know the fact that you don't particularly want the chair, <laughs> and you're happy for somebody else to chair, uh, you know, can work against that. But you know, I, I think it is it, it is often impatience that gets in the way. But sometimes that is a good thing, and if that, as I say, forces you to actually look at why is this taking so long, and as I say, to have to make a hard decision, we're going to have to commit more resources to it. Perhaps that's not a bad thing. The instinct is to get in there and sort it out myself quickly. If I'm really honest because you think you can see the way through the issue. You've thought about it, you know what you think the answer is. Well, I think I probably um, was capable of, and still am, of going at both ends of the spectrum wrongly. In some cases, too dogmatic, uh, not actually listening, thinking I was listening when I wasn't. In other cases, seeking a bogus degree of consensus when actually you needed to thrash issues out and get more clarity rather than fudge. I would suggest that one of the other keys to all of this is if you want a successful collaboration you start by packing your own ego. It, so you can be authoritative, you can be uh, ruthless, but that doesn't involve your ego. If you start being ruthless because of your ego you're in every kind of trouble. Yeah, I think probably the most, uh, most difficult thing I had to learn along the way, most, most particularly once I became successful, was how the, how the intervention of my own ego inevitably damaged what I was trying to do. Because it's baggage, it just gets in the way, for it, it, it prevents you from empathising, it prevents you from fully understanding what you're trying to do, it prevents you from setting a good example, that's the most important thing. It, it, that, I think, yes, that's the key. Good leaders set a really good example. That's your job. Your job is to exemplify the very best of what the people around you want to be or want the project to be. Am I a natural collaborator? Well, I would say I was. I, um, I started a lot of my career uh, around things where I was planning teams. I didn't realise at the time quite how seminal they would be for me later on in life, but there's always a point where teams have got to decide the balance of the individual against the collective effort. The National Health Service, I think, is a really interesting organisation. Partly it's big enough as an organisation to live within its own walls, so we can have our own tribes and our own sort of differences within our own sort of organisational structure to, to, have, to give us a platform to avoid it to anybody else outside the health service. The second thing is that the health service has always had a sort of like clear drive that it, it brought a degree of professional expertise and so it's kind of at its heart was this notion that you'd come to the National Health Service and the health service could sort you out and that would sort out the problem. And as a consequence of that, some of our really deep set underlying values and sort of like, uh, f for all benevolent reasons, are about what the health service can do to you. So let me give you a very, very good example of the health service on its collaboration. We see the customers that we serve as units of need. So our public health departments will describe the number of diabetics in a particular population or the number of people with cardiovascular disease. We don't see the assets of that individual, in particular about looking after themselves and their own lifestyles. You know, we don't see any partners around that. We just see a diabetic, someone with diabetes. And so trying to help the health service understand that actually it doesn't exist in a vacuum, that even, even for people who've got very, very serious, complex problems, there are other players who've got an opportunity to help that individual themselves, their carers, their, uh, um, their, the environment in which they live, their housing contribution, for example. All of that matters. Trying to get that into play in the health service is quite tough. I think that some leaders in the health service do get this, but it's quite a battle because sometimes it's countercultural. 
Well, one of the perceptions, of course, is that collaboration is all about sitting around committees talking to each other, mm. and uh, you know the uh, uh, the uh, the problem of trying to uh, uh, design a way um, and create services when all you've really done is kind of scratch your own navel and think about well, what 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 would we think about things? So I'm absolutely convinced that. A lot of the reason why people find collaboration difficult is in their heads they think collaboration is about uh, sitting, talking and doing nothing. Of course, my point would be that unless you've actually got the right platform in place, simply acting rather than having some agreements about what you're trying to do is, is again, counterproductive. And I've seen lots of examples of individuals who assumed that they knew what other partners would want and went off and did it. So there is inevitably an element of it, I'm sad to say for those people who don't like meetings, that does require you to communicate properly and share something with, with colleagues. But I think you can do that much sooner than we do. And I, I would agree that there is a fair, fair amount of labouring of that stage. My sense is that if you can get through that stage with real purpose and you can be focused in those conversations, you can get on then to get real synergy and action reflecting personal uh, and professional roles without having to come back all constantly and check out are we doing the right thing. Most people will collaborate when they're absolutely convinced that there's no better way of doing it. And the point I would say is that those people who naturally collaborate intuitively believe that, that that moment when they choose to engage other people is actually the moment at which they are more likely to succeed in what they're trying to do than less likely to succeed. So if I'm failing as an organisation and all of all everything's falling down around my head, I need to fundamentally believe that picking up the phone and having a conversation with A and other or pulling together a meeting of people is going to help me get this, these bricks that are falling down around me off my, off my back better than if I spent the time just lifting individual bricks. And one of the things that I, I talk a lot about this notion of um, people who are in organisations who are trying to sort of like sort of do everything themselves and, and it's just completely and utterly counterproductive because the people who can help the most you know, they're actually sort of getting in the way of them. They are, they're trying to do it themselves. They're trying to operate as an island. And, and their, only, their only means of understanding how success could be delivered for them is to think, I just need to work harder. And the truth is that that very, very rarely ends up being the right answer. In experience, I've, I've found often that I was at my greatest as a leader when I was most vulnerable. And I asked, I asked other people to help. Because me thinking that I knew it all and I could do it all we'll get a result, but it's not got as good a result as the times when I had to turn around and say, I really, I, I need the help. I need some help here. And then people are motivated, people are inspired to try and do something for you. And what you get then is better than it would have been had you worked it on, through on your own. If, if I reflected on the things that I think are important in this, in this kind of area, I would go for walking other people's shoes. If you can understand what it is that you're asking someone to do from their perspective, you've got a far, far better chance to get that to happen. Secondly is remember that there are lots of things that go to motivate people beyond just giving information. You know, a lot of the reasons why we do things is because of our emotions, not about our beliefs. Uh, because other people do them, so normative pressure is still critical. And the third thing is that I think you've got to be authentic. I think you need to be true to yourself. So as a leader, you need to reflect your own values, and people will find out very quickly if you're not being true to yourself in the way that you speak to them. So trying to collaborate as a leader, I've, I've got a quite an intimidating presence. So natural instinct, I used to play sport. I was a centre-half. I was a fast bowler. You know, all my kind of way of being can be quite intimidating and to collaborate properly people have to be able to feel that they can work with you and that you're not trying to take their space or impose your will upon people and so I think that constant assessment of what's my impact with the people I'm with 